Well, I'll just kick it off with the first one. Um, as we celebrate 500 years from when Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses upon the Wittenberg Cathedral doors, we are undoubtedly speaking highly of men like Luther, Calvin, Bucer, Zwingli, and the truths they heralded and established. However, inevitably, conversation comes up about, for instance, Luther's anti-Semitic writings or Calvin's involvement in the death of Servetus. So the question is this, how should we consider these men who were so monumentally used by God for great good, and yet we see either glaring flaws or blind spots in their lives, how should we see them, feel about them, if we find genuinely troubling truths about their personal lives, or even perhaps a doctrinal stance they may have held? Uh, my answer to that is the same answer I would give if you asked about the list of heroes of the faith in Hebrews 11. You read that list in Hebrews 11, and it includes men like Samson, who uh, in so many ways was a spiritual disaster. He uh, was dedicated by his parents at a very young age, you know, to, be, to live the lifelong role of a Nazarite, which meant that he couldn't cut his hair, he, couldn't, he wasn't supposed to touch wine or any of the fruit of the vine, and he wasn't supposed to touch dead bodies. He did all those things. And, uh, you know, he ate the honey out of the corpse of a lion and then boasted about it and uh, just lived a profligate life and, and uh, dishonored his parents because he wanted to marry a Philistine girl and they were appalled by that, that idea. Uh, so he married a pagan girl and he, he was, uh, that got him into a fight with her in-laws in which he had to kill a bunch of them. You look at his life in terms of, you know, 21st century moral standards, and you say this man was a disaster. He was an absolute disaster, and yet Scripture lists him as one of the heroes of the faith. Uh, and the answer is we're all flawed. Some of us are flawed more than others, but all men are flawed, and God has always used flawed men. David committed adultery and murder, and those are sins which admittedly would disqualify a man from leading the church today. If I knew that was... Uh, if I knew someone who wanted to be a pastor and he had committed adultery and, you know, arranged for the death of his uh, paramour's r legitimate husband, I would say there's no way that man can ever be above reproach. He, he cannot, uh, even if he's repented afterwards, I wouldn't want to see him in a pastoral ro role because he's not above reproach, and that's the first requirement for a pastor. And yet, uh, the Lord kept him as king of Israel, and uh, he, he is the one from whom the messianic line uh, descended. So the Lord can overrule his own, uh, I mean, he, he justifies the ungodly, right? Uh, it's not that he throws out justice, and it's not that he throws out morality. Be sure your sin will find you out. And in all those cases, it does. But the fact that men have flaws doesn't mean God can't use them. And it doesn't mean that we shouldn't honor them for their faith and their faithfulness where they were faithful. I think Calvin's flaws are often grossly exaggerated. He didn't, he didn't personally kill Servetus. He simply said, you know, by the laws of the time, it, it, what, what Servetus did, teaching heresy and sedition and uh, anarchy, he was an anarchist, uh, was worthy of the death penalty by the civil laws of the time. And Calvin actually pleaded for a more merciful form of execution than burning him at the stake. And it was the city council who said, no, we're going to burn him at the stake. So Calvin in that, I think, is often portrayed as a murderer and a bloodthirsty man when he was not. If you know Calvin's character and read his sermons and all that, you find he's a much better man than either Catholics or Arminians want to admit. Uh, it's true that Luther became anti-Semitic. He didn't start out that way, uh, but as time went by, he became frustrated. He, he believed that when, once the gospel was clarified and, and he had dug out the, the doctrine of justification by faith from under centuries of Roman Catholic tradition, he believed that the Jewish people, when they heard the gospel, would respond. And when they didn't, he grew frustrated and uh, wrote some pretty harshly anti-Semitic material. 
Uh, and there's no excuse for that. There's no way to say, well, that wasn't really so bad. It was, it was bad, and there were other things Luther did that were bad. He had a, he had a vile mouth. Uh, you know, he... Um, now, everything Luther said, even privately, was taken down by students of his and published posthumously in a collection called Table Talk. And you'll find most of the outrageous things uh, Luther said you'll find in his table talk, not in his commentaries or his thoughtful writings. So in a way, it's not fair uh, to Luther to, to think that things he meant to be in private discourse, things he, where he might have been joking even, things he didn't write himself, other people took it down. And if you've ever had other people take down your words and tweet them, they never get it exactly right either. And uh, whatever you say that sounds bad is going to be exaggerated by the people who record it. So you, ha you do have to cut Luther a little slack on that. But there's no question, he was a flawed man. And uh, some of the reformers had pretty severe short-sighted flaws. Uh, but we honor them nevertheless for their faith and their faithfulness while we recognize their flaws and say, you know, there's no way to justify that. One of my favorite theologians uh, in America is R.L. Dabney. He was a Presbyterian theologian, and I firmly believe that he would be remembered as America's greatest theologian ever, except that he got embroiled in the Civil War. He was a Southern Presbyterian during the time of the Civil War. He was the, the chaplain to uh, Stonewall Jackson, so he was actually in the military and fought uh, for the South in the war. And when the South lost, he became embittered and never really got over it. And some of his later writings also are racist, you know, just racist. And so much so that when uh, the Banner of Truth published his collected writings on essays and stuff like that, it's called Discussions. It's actually my favorite set of books. Of all the books on my shelf, that's the one I would least like to, to lose because there's some just brilliant material in there. But when Banner of Truth, it was originally four volumes, and when Banner of Truth picked it up and published it, they made it three volumes because they took out, there was so much racist material at the end that they had to take out. Uh, so they deleted half of volume three and most of volume four and put it in three volumes. Uh, and I look at Dabney and I think, what a shame. What a shame. I mean, he was a product of his times. Uh, and what a shame that he couldn't rise above that and see beyond that because he understood doctrine and loved the scriptures and loved Christ and I'm sure his level of spiritual maturity was far beyond mine so uh, I feel bad even criticizing him but you have to step back and look at that and say he like like all those reformers was a flawed man and sometimes our flaws outlive uh, and sometimes even overshadow our good qualities um, you know, it's one of my fears, frankly, because I put a lot of stuff on the Internet, and uh, over the years, some of the things I've written on the Internet have made people angry. And, and I hope, you know, succeeding generations don't look, and look back and say that the thing that stands out about me is that I was a, you know, sarcastic badmouther. I recognize I have flaws just like those men, uh, and it's a shame when our flaws overshadow our Good things, but I don't think that's the case with the reformers. I think the benefits of their ministries really outshine their flaws. The flaws are undeniable, but it's no reason, just because you realize a man has a serious character flaw, isn't necessarily a reason to write off his legacy entirely if he's a man whom God used in a, in a mighty way. And there are lots of biblical examples of that, Samson being the one I, I cited, David being another, there are others. Uh, who did heinous sins, and yet Scripture commends them for their faith.